everyone, welcome back. We're all here, and me and Moz, to read the next chapter of Journey to the River Sea, um, which is chapter 11. So I hope you enjoy. I'm going to read the whole thing because I think it's only 11 pages. So settle down and get comfy and um, yeah, let's get going. So chapter 11. By the time Clovis had been in Finn's hut for three days, he knew Westwood by heart. He could go upstairs and downstairs into the attics where the maid Bella had hidden Bernard's secret pile of money and into the cellar where he'd made friends with the bats. He knew the outhouse where Bernard had kept a pet rat and the tree to which Dudley and Joan had tied a little girl from the village and beaten her with willow twigs because she'd been trespassing by the lake. And he could imitate any accent. After he's been here there a week, he'll be talking like Sir Aubrey or braying like Joan, Finn said to Maya. The Goodleys had taught Clovis to fence and he had been in so many different play sets, uh, plays set in grand houses that it his table manners were excellent. If he got to Westwood, Finn was sure he could hold out for a little while. Finn had showed him a map of the north of England, and Clovis had discovered that the village where his foster mother lived was only 30 miles away, which had cheered him up a lot. But he's such a coward, Finn said to Maya. They were scraping the old paint off Arabella's deck fittings, a job which Clovis did not care for. I don't think it's cowardly to be afraid of hiding in a dark cellar and waiting to be snatched by two horrible crows, said Maya. Finn frowned. You're always defending him, he said crossly. Well, he's alone in the world. So am I alone in the world, said Finn. No, you aren't. You've got Lila, who adores you, and Professor Glastonbury, and the Chief of Police, and all the Indians here. And when you get to the canter, you'll probably have lots and lots of relatives, aunts and uncles and cousins, and maybe grandparents too. A huge family. Do you think so? I hadn't thought of it like that. Finn didn't look particularly pleased. Maya nodded. It's sure to be like that, whereas Clovis and I don't have anybody. You've got Miss Minton. It was Maya's turn to stare. Three months ago, she hadn't known that Miss Minton existed. When she'd first seen her, she thought she was a terrifying witch. But now, there was a pause. Then, and you've got me, said Finn. Maya lifted her head and smiled at him. For a moment, she felt completely happy. Then she looked at Finn's hand, resting on the tiller. But you're going away. Yes, he said, that's true. I'm going away. Later that night, when Maya was back in the bungalow and Finn was frying some eggs Fiora had bought for their supper, Clover said, there's something I want to ask you about. When I was looking for Maya the first time, I asked for a place called Tapparini or the House of Rest. Maya told me that this was that that was what it was called, and that Mrs Carter had had it on her notepaper, but no one had heard of it, and they looked sort of funny. And then the captain of the boat wouldn't put me down on the Carter's landing stage. He said it's a bad place. What did he mean? Finn sat back on his heels. He seemed to be wondering whether to speak or not. Then he said, I'll tell you, but you must promise not to say anything to Maya. And he told Clovis what had happened when the Carters first came to the Amazon. They found an Indian longhouse by the river and some thatched huts back in the forest. The land and the houses belong to the Tapuri, which is the tribe to which Fiora and Tapi belong. But many of the Indians had left to find work in the town and the elders of the tribe agreed to sell the land and the houses on, on it to the Carters. The price was agreed before witnesses, a proper ceremony took place and Mr Carter signed the document to which the old chief put his mark. The Tapuri asked that the House of Rest, which was what the Longhouse had been called, should be left standing, because a very wise medicine man had died there, and his spirit still lived in the house and didn't want to be disturbed. Mr Carter agreed to everything. Good land by the river was hard to find, since so many Europeans had come to Manaus to make their fortune, and the rubber trees in the surrounding forests were plentiful. The money was to be paid to the Indians in three lots. Mr Carter paid the first lot promptly, in gold coins fetched from the bank, and the chief of the Tapuri thanked him and took his people to build themselves homes further up the river. A month later, the chief's messenger came for the second lot of money and was sent away. Mr Carter, he was told, was waiting for more gold to come from the bank in England on a special ship. The messenger went back into the forest and came again a month later. He was told that the ship with the gold on it had sunk in a storm. And so it went on. 
the Indians began by being polite and ended up shaking their fists at the carters. Those Europeans who knew what was happening went to the chief of police, who tried to force Carter to pay what he owed, but Carter always found an excuse not to do it. Not only that, but he broke his word to the Indians and pulled down not only the surrounding huts in the forest, but the longhouse itself, and on the site he built his bungalow. Mrs Carter had Taparini, or House of Rest, put on her writing paper. She thought it sounded good, but no one in Manaus ever called it that. Nor would the Indian traders land on the Carter's landing stage, but always, like the captain who had bought Clovis, stopped higher up. And the many decent Europeans who knew what had happened tried to do have as little to do with the Carters as possible. After this, not many Indians would come to work for the family. Those that did, Furo and Tapie and old Lila, stayed for personal reasons. Lila, because she wanted to be near Finn and his father. Furo, because he was her nephew. Conchita, because she'd a crippled brother to support in Manaus. When they worked in the house, they were unforgiving and sullen and secretly they believed that one day the old medicine man's medicine man's spirit which had been disturbed and shamed would rise up against the carters and the family would get what they deserved clovis had been listening to finn with a very worried face but that sort of curse maya shouldn't live in a house that's been cursed i know but nobody has cursed maya nobody in the world would do that and fury and the others have promised to look after her they absolutely promise and you're not going to tell maya no definitely not She's got enough to put up with, with those awful twins. Mrs Carter had arranged, had l at last arranged Maya's piano lessons with Neto's father, Mr Holtman. Maya went to his house before the dancing class while the twins were shopping with their mother, so she could enjoy it and not have to pretend that learning the piano was boring. If there was one thing the twins really hated, it was that if Maya seemed to enjoy anything. Mr Holtman came from Vienna and he was the first class musician he not only taught Maya on the piano, he understood her need to learn the songs she heard everywhere, in the streets of Manaus, on the riverboats, in the huts of the workers. It's a rich land for music, Brazil. Everything flows into everything else. In one song you can hear the rhythm of the Africans, the poetry of the Portuguese, and the sadness of the Indians. He promised to look at the songs she had written down, and he suggested too that she had singing lessons and train her voice, but this she wouldn't do. My mother was a singer. She was wonderful and I don't want to try and copy her, she said. The other good thing which came out of her time with the Holtmans was Netta's friendship. The Austrian girl welcomed her wholeheartedly. She had a litter, litter of kittens in a basket, a basset hound with soulful eyes, and a baby brother as fat as butter. Netta walked with her afterwards to the dancing class, and if Maya forgot to put on a gloomy face when she saw the twins sitting with their legs stuck out in the locker room waiting to have their shoes put on, she was in trouble. What are you smirking about? asked Beatrice now. I suppose you're waiting for Sergi to ask you to dance. The twins' plans to get for getting rid of Maya were not going well. They'd been to her room and picked over her things, but Miss Minton had heard them, and since they themselves never went outdoors, it was difficult to spy on Maya properly. The notice of the reward for the capture of Taverner's son was still on the hoardings, but time was running out. Mr Lowe and Mr Trapwood were supposed to be leaving on the bishop in three days' time. Sergi did ask Maya to dance. Not only that, but he has to, asked her to a party. It's on Friday night. It's for Olga's birthday. I know it's very short notice, but my father has, has to go to Belém the next day and he, we wanted him to be here. Maya hesitated. Friday night was the night Clovis was to hide in the museum. For her to be in Manaus then would be perfect if she was, betray, if she was to betray Clovis to the twins, but only if the twins were there as well. I'd love to, she said, but I don't think I can come without Beatrice and Gwendolyn. I'm sort of their guest. You know how it is. Sergi looked mullish. They're horrible. I hate them. But if you won't come without them, I'll ask Olga. Olga also disliked the twins, but she too said that if Maya couldn't come without them, then she'd better bring them along. If Miss Minton comes too, it ought to be all right, said Sergi. She'll keep them in order, and she gets on well with our Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle Lil. And there's no trouble about you getting home. Uh, getting you home. My father will send you back in one of our boats. The Kaminskys are one of the richest families in Manaus. Sergei's father, Count Kaminsky, owned huge plantations of rubber trees. He treated his work as well, and the money flowed in, not only from rubber, but from hardwoods and coffee and sugar cane. Maya had passed their house, a big mansion with pink walls and blue shutters and a garden full of flowering trees. There couldn't be anywhere better for a party. If the twins were pleased to be invited, they didn't show it. 
Only Mrs Carter's eyes gleamed. She hated the Russian family, but a count was a count, and who knew what might come out of it for her girls? Finn's dog was called Rob, but no one used his name much. He was somehow all dogs rolled into one with his trust and intelligence and faithfulness, and though he could hunt his own food and steady the canoe by putting his weight in the right place, he understood that when humans were upset, one had to sit there while they pulled one's ears or buried their faces in one's back or even cried. A dog who will allow himself to be cried over is worth his weight in gold. He had been Bernard Taverner's dog and now was Finn's and other people did not interest him very much. But he was always polite to Maya and as she rubbed his back and said, oh, I don't know how I'm going to get the twins to do what I want, he caught the worry in her voice and did not move away though he had heard some interesting noises in the bushes behind the hut. It's quite easy, said Clovis, and Maya looked up, surprised, for, Clo for Clovis was not usually a boy who found things easy. It's just acting. Yes, but I can't act. Anyone can act, said Clovis. There are just a few tricks. Techniques, they're called, but they're just tricks, really. They had just finished afternoon tea in the hut, which was Clovis's favourite meal. But when it was cleared, he said, look, watch me. He went to the window of the hut and looked out seeming to be interested in what he saw. Then he came back and sat down. After a while, he got up and did the same thing. The third time, Maya got up and followed him to the window. You see, said Clovis, if you go to the window twice, the third time people will always follow you. It's the same when you're pretending to give someone the slip, but really you want them to come after you. Don't pause and look round furt furtively. Furtively? Hmm, I don't know that word. Furtively. Just keep changing your pace, sometimes dawdle, sometimes run. So, while Finn checked the list of things that Clovis would need for his night in the museum, Clovis coached Maya in how to act the part of someone with a guilty secret. Because they mustn't think I want to betray Finn. She said, they know I wouldn't do that, they must think I've done it by mistake. Just before, just before Furo came to fetch Maya, Finn took her aside and took something out of his pocket of his trousers. Look, he said, and held out to her a beautiful silver pocket watch on a long chain. He clicked it open and showed her the initials, B.T., engraved inside. Your father's. <sighs> Sorry. Yes, he gave it to me on my last birthday. It was the only thing he bought from Westwood. I feel I ought to give it to Clovis. It would make them absolutely certain he was me. But your father wanted you to have it. Yes, said Finn, looking stricken, but if it would help... He shook his head. Never mind, it's for me to decide. Then Furo's canoe came up through the reeds and Maya hugged Clovis and said goodbye. If everything went according to plan, Clovis would be on the boat the day after tomorrow. And it was hard leaving him. But I expect you'll come to England, won't you? Clovis said. He'd given her the address of his foster mother. I wish you were coming now, he said, and his eyes filled with tears. As Finn helped Maya into the boat, he leant forward and whispered in her ear. Don't worry about Clovis, he said. I'll see he's all right. I won't let him get too scared, I promise. And Maya nodded and got into the canoe and was paddled away. That settles it, said Mr Trapwood. We're going back to the pension. We're going to pack. We're going to be on the bishop first thing tomorrow. So Aubrey will have to send someone else out. Nothing is worth another day in this hellhole. Mr Lowe didn't answer. He'd caught a fever and was lying at the bottom of a large canoe owned by the brothers of the Sao Gabriel mission, who had... Sal Gabriel mission, who had arranged for the crows to be taken back to Manaus. His eyes were closed and he was wandering uh, and he was wandering a little in his mind, mumbling about a boy with the cut with hair the colour of the belly of the golden toad which squatted on the lily leaves of the Mamari River. There had of course been no golden haired boys, but there hadn't been any boys at all. What what there had been was a leper colony run by the Brothers of St. Patrick, a group of Irish missionaries who, to whom the crows had been sent. They're good men, the brothers, a man on the docks had told them as they set off on their last search for the taverner's son. They'd taken all sorts of strays, orphans, boys with no homes. If anyone knows where taverner's lad it might be, it'll be them. Then he had spat cheerfully into the river because he was a crony of the chief of police and liked the idea of Mr Lowe and Mr Trapwood spending time with the brothers, who were very holy men indeed, and s slept on the hard ground and ate porridge made from man manioc roots and got up four times in the night to pray. The brothers' mission was on a swampy part of the river and very unhealthy, but the brothers only thought about God and helping their fellow man. They welcomed Mr Trapwood and Mr Lowe and they said they could look over the leper colony to see if they could find anyone who might turn out to be the boy they were looking for. 
They're a jolly lot, the lepers, said Father Liam. People who have suffered don't have time to grumble. But the crows, turning green, thought that there wouldn't be much point. Even if there was a boy there right in at the right age, Sir Aubrey probably wouldn't think that a boy who was a leper could manage Westwood. Later, a group of pilgrim in, pilgrims arrived who had been walking on foot from the Andes and were there were on their way to a shrine in the Madeira River, and the brothers knelt and washed their feet. We know you'll be proud to share the sleeping hut with our friends here, they said to Mr Lowe and Mr Trapwood, and the crows spent the night on the floor with twelve snoring, grunting men, and woke to find two large and hungry-looking vultures squatting in the doorway. By the time they returned to Manaus, the crows were beaten men. They didn't care any longer about Tavernus' son, or Sir Aubrey, or even a hundred pounds bonus they'd lost. All they cared about was getting on to the bishop and steaming away as fast as it could be done. Sound like they had a pretty miserable time, didn't they? Dear, oh dear. I'm sorry, I didn't seem to read that very well today. I was stumbling over my words, so I apologise. But for line class people, you know that that happens to me all the time. But to plumsters and to birch people, you don't know, but now you do. Um, so I hope you're all managing to keep healthy and well. And I will upload um, chapter 12 later on in the week, probably Friday now. Okay, take care. Lots of love. Bye.